Hello everyone, so I have the uh, honour of introducing our guest for today. Um, so born in Australia, Natalie Bennett gained a Bachelor's of Agricultural Science from the University of Sydney before going on to study a BA in Asian Studies at the University of New England and then a Master's of Mass Communication at the University of Leicester, so quite an eclectic mix. Her previous career was in journalism and she rose to prominence as editor of The Guardian Weekly. In 2006, she joined the UK Green Party and she's been instrumental in shaping its direction ever since. She founded the Green Party's women's group and went on, of course, in September 2012 to become a uh, party leader. The Green Party has long been respected as a sword of radical politics here in the UK and it stuck to its principles and therefore I think it really set itself apart in an era where people talk about the rush to the centre ground and political disengagement, particularly amongst young people. It succeeded in setting the agenda on a range of issues, from social justice uh, to economic policy uh, and, of course, ecological sustainability. The Green Party now has a member in the House of Lords, uh, that's Lord Jones, three MEPs representing the UK, two London Assembly members, 160 councillors across the country, uh, and since 2010, of course, their first elected Member of Parliament, that's Caroline Lucas. In terms of rank and file party membership, the party is booming and the Greens will be contesting seats uh, in next year's general election nationwide. So Natalie Bennett is the first UK political party leader to come and visit the NCS uh, and we're really absolutely delighted and honoured to welcome you here together today. So please now join with me in welcoming the leader of the UK Na uh, Green Party, Natalie Bennett. Thank you very much, and it's lovely to be here. I have to say, you have the most beautiful space to be studying in, uh, and, and I, hope, I hope you really enjoy it. Um, uh, you've got the introduction, so you know where my accent comes from, um, and also the fact that my first degree was agricultural science. Uh, if you put those two things together, one of the things the British media has most been most interested in about me, possibly this tells you more about the British media than it does about me, is the fact that I am probably the only British political leader who knows how to shear a sheep. <laughs> As I said, it tells you more about the media than it does about me. And I have to apologise for being late this morning. I'm afraid I got, uh, got waylaid by the Rochester and Screwed by-election, which you probably heard happened yesterday. Very pleased with the results of that. We've more than doubled our vote since the 2010 uh, general election. Uh, and we uh, did get five times the red spot. So we're feeling quite pleased about that. Uh, and one of the other things I'm really pleased about is actually when I went down to Rochester and Strood, people are really clearly identifying us and people were coming up to us in the street. And actually, probably it's worth telling you what it's like when, when, when a constituency has a by-election. Uh, you've probably seen all of the leaders, all of the MPs, all of the ministers flooding down to visit Rochester and Strood. And very quickly, uh, the people in that constituency learn, when they see a rosette that someone wearing they're a politician, they learn to turn on their heel really fast and run in the other direction. And that's usually what campaigning in a by-election is like. But actually, I was really pleased when I went down there a couple of weeks ago. We had a Green Party stall out on the high street. And people were coming up to us and saying, we're really glad you're here. We see you as the anti-UKIP party. And that was people, I think, were very explicitly voting for us because I think we've stood, particularly on immigration issues, where the party was stuck against UKIP in terms of the dreadful race to the bottom and immigration rhetoric we've seen. And what we've been saying, you know, I understand why lots of people are feeling really stressed and worried about the state of the world, the state of their lives today. But when often the first thing they say is, oh, I'm worried about immigration, and you say, what are you really worried about? And what you usually find is they answer three things. They either answer that I'm really worried about low wages, I'm really worried about housing and the fact that my kids can't get a council house, and I'm really, really worried about crowded schools and hospitals. And my answer to all of those things is you're absolutely right to be worried about those, but they're caused by government policy. They're not caused by immigration. If you take low wages, we have a minimum wage that's significantly below the living wage. We have uh, that low minimum wage, which isn't enough anyway, isn't adequately enforced. We have people who work in home care in particular is a really good example. And they get paid for a 15 minute visit here and a half hour visit over there, and then maybe an hour down there. And they're not paid for their travel time in between. And so they are paid less than the apparently legal minimum wage. And then we come to housing, 
And first of all, we've got a situation where we've got rich property speculators buying up property and renting it out at massively inflated rents. We've also got right to buy that sees we're losing the housing stock that we should be using, that we should have available to house the people who need it. Uh, and we've also got a situation where we're simply not building enough houses. And all of those things are failures of government policy. They're not the result of immigration. And then finally, the crowded schools and hospitals. Well, this government and the previous government slashed the funding on hospitals. And of course, more than a quarter of doctors in the NHS are immigrants. The MHS couldn't run without them. And yet what we've got is a situation where we need more investment in the NHS and we also need a healthier society. Because the fact is we've got a situation where people work long hours, they're stressed, they live in overcrowded housing, we've got a huge problem with air pollution, walking here from the tube, I mean, that was uh, very evident. <coughs> um, and yeah, we've got a really unhealthy society. And then when we look at schools, you know, we've got a situation where we've had Michael Gove that stopped local authorities planning for schools, and they just have to wait for free schools or academies to pop up. So I say there's an awful lot wrong with Britain today, and none of it is caused by immigration. So that's sort of a bit of a perspective on Rochester and Strew since it's in the news today. But I'd, I'd like to go back a little and sort of talk and look at the state of the world. And where I very often start when I'm thinking about talking to groups of young people like yourselves, is I have to start off by saying, on behalf of my generation, and I'm 48, my generation to your generation, I have to say, I'm sorry, because we've made a right mess of it, all of us collectively. We've left you with an economic crisis where we have the banks still out of control, still massive fraud, massive corruption, we have a situation where we've got a social crisis, where last year in Britain, one million people, here in the world's sixth richest economy, one million people last year had to go to food banks. And of course, a large part of that, and the government never talks about this, a large part of that is the fact that 22% of workers are on less than a living wage. They can work full time, but they're not paid enough money to live on. And at the same time, we've got big multinational companies not paying their taxes and not paying their workers properly. And just to sort of make that real, I'll kind of bet that pretty well everybody in this room has either in the last year either bought or had bought for them something from the website Amazon. Yeah. Usually people have. It's very hard to avoid. Um, and you know, last year Amazon paid 0.01% of its turnover in tax in Britain. It effectively paid no tax at all. It's sucking massive profits out of British society. It's a parasite that's taking those profits and not paying back. And if you think about that in really sort of concrete terms, the road out there, I'll guarantee today there will be lots of lorries running up and down that road carrying Amazon parcels. There might even be one right at this moment. All of us, when you, you, you buy things, when you buy buy food, when you buy takeaway, when you buy lots of things, you'll be paying tax. Your tax is helping to maintain that road. So you're paying to maintain that road. But Amazon isn't paying its share to maintain that road. So we've got the economic crisis, the social crisis, and of course we've also got an environmental crisis. You probably know a bit about climate change. Happily at the moment it's in the news quite a lot, and for some good reasons. An agreement between the US and China is really important. But what we've also got is so many other crises. And there was a report out a couple of months ago now. The amount of wildlife in the world, the number of animals in the world, has fallen 50% in the last 40 years. There are, few, there are half the number of animals in the world that there were when I was born. And that's a massive rate of decline that we simply can't allow to continue. And now, when you think of these things, you often probably think of you know, exotic animals far away, tigers and whales and big charismatic species. But one of the things to think about Britain and what we're doing to the landscape of Britain today is the fact that hedgehogs, that's rather nice, most of us like the idea, the nice pictures, the idea if you had a garden, you'd like to have hedgehogs snuffling around in your garden, it's kind of rural little. Populations of hedgehogs have gone down 38% 
year on year for the past 10 years. 38% the first year, down 38% on the next figure, down and down and down. And that's a measure of the kind of farming, what we're doing to our environment, building on the green belt, cutting up the land with roads, and basically making it really impossible for our wildlife to live. So those are the three crises that I'm sorry my generation is that you. But it's also a huge opportunity, because actually where we are at this moment, the current status quo, the state of things today, is not going to continue. It's very clearly, obviously, unstable. And that gives us a real chance to, our, all of us, my generation, your, ch your generation, the chance to build something much better. To build a society that works for the common good, not just for the few. And if we're going to think about what that means, I think we can start with where we are now. Because basically the past 40 years of British political life has been dominated by what you might call neoliberal or neo thatcherite ideas. The idea that greed is good, if fine, if the rich keep getting richer, we can just keep plundering the planet. And those ideas have clearly failed even in their own terms. The idea that austerity that this government brought in was going to solve the deficit. It's not solving the deficit, and what it's doing is making the poor, the disadvantaged, and particularly you, the young, pay for the errors and the fraud of the bankers. Because that's what caused the deficit. It was the bankers' failures. It wasn't the government spending that caused that deficit problem. So what we need to do is build a society that's something different. And I'm going to start with a suggestion of two things. What we should do, the kind of criteria we should apply for the new society, is first of all, everybody in this society should have access to the resources for a decent quality of life. That's no ifs, no buts, and particularly no worry, no fear. No one should have to worry about putting food on the table. And the other thing we have to do is we have to do all of that collectively within the limits of one planet. We have to live within the limits of the planet because we've only got one planet. And all of us collectively in Britain, no matter how we actually live at the moment individually, collectively, we're living like we've got three planets. And we've only got one, and that's got to stop. So the kind of things that I propose, that I think we have to introduce, is first of all, we have to make the minimum wage a living wage. If you work full time, you should earn enough money to live on. And we should ban zero hours contracts. No one can build their life on starting the week, not knowing how much money you're going to earn at the end of it through absolutely no fault of your own. And you know, the zero hours contracts started in some you know, fairly basic low paid jobs, but they're spreading. Many of you no doubt will be going on to university quite a lot of your university lecturers will be on zero hours contracts. And that will hurt you as students because they're going to have less time to devote to you because they only get as many hours as they've got a number of students and that's it. They're not full-time workers. And there's many nurses, doctors, accountants who are also having to try and live on zero hours contracts now. And it's simply not acceptable and we should say you get a contract to work, you get to work every week. That's the way it should be. And one of the other things we need to say in this new kind of world is we have to defend benefits, defend welfare, and say that if we are, and we want to be, a decent, humane society, benefits should be available to everyone who needs them. Not grudgingly, not like it's charity, but in acceptance that in a decent, humane society, we will give help to people who need it. And the fact is, and this is something that perhaps people don't like to think about, but all of us collectively, except perhaps the 1% of the richest, all of us are only one medical accident, one car crash, one company redundancy when you're in work, away from needing some help. And that help should be, be, be there. It's a joint insurance that we all provide for each other as a community. And what the Green Party suggests going a bit further than that is we propose the idea of a basic income or a citizen's income. These days in the age of UK, I prefer basic income, but there's a lot of good work being done on citizen's income too. And this is the idea that if you're accepted as a member of this society, once you live here, or simply once you're born, you will get each week enough money to meet your basic needs. 
the moment that we're looking at a figure of around 80 pounds a week. And you get that basic income as a matter of right, as a citizen, as a person in this society. And then this has a whole lot of benefits. If you go and earn a significant amount of money, that's fine. You just pay it back in tax, so it balances out. It doesn't have any real impact on your income. But first of all, it costs almost nothing to administer. Um, slight child benefit it costs about 1% of the total cost of what you're paying out. Um, whereas by contrast, things like job seekers allowance, you know, filling this 67 page form and a report once a week to the job seekers to a staff member costs a fortune to administer. Uh, the other thing it does is it takes away any kind of benefit trap. You get this money as a matter of right every week, and if you say you're caring for an older relative, caring for a disabled child, and you get the chance to do a little bit of work, maybe you've got some, some of the other relatives helping out with some care for a few days, you go and do a bit of work, you don't utterly mess up your benefits, you don't see the housing benefit disappear, you don't end up in the whole deep mess that the benefit system traps so many people in now and end up at the payday lender before you know it. You still have that money coming in every week regularly and there's no such thing as a sanction. It's not like with job seekers allowance now where this government is applying hideous arbitrary sanctions to people who suddenly find themselves with absolutely nothing. And I, I've got lots of horror stories about how sanctions for job seekers allowance work at the moment but one of them comes from Caroline Lucas, the Green MP one of her constituents. He was sanctioned because he didn't go to an interview at the job centre because he was at a job interview. <laughs> so you know, we have a citizen's income, we have a decent wage, and we have rich individuals and multinational companies paying their taxes. And the interesting thing is even organisations like the IMF and the World Bank, organisations that aren't uh, you know, what you might think of as left-wing or radical, they say that inequality in our society, the gap between the richest 1%, particularly the richest 0, 1.1% and the rest of us, has just got too large. And that's a huge, not just a social problem, but an economic problem. And that's why in the Green Party we call for a wealth tax. So we're saying if you're worth more than £3 million, and that rather neatly comes to the top, wealthiest 1% in our society, uh, Occupy is 1% if you know about Occupy. Uh, you should pay 1 or 2% of that every year in tax. And this actually isn't meant to be a punitive tax. It's not a punishment for being rich. It simply acknowledges that, although sometimes it might be hard to believe, the rich are actually people too, like the rest of us. And they might need the NHS services. They might have private health care, but if they're really, really critically seriously ill, they'll end up at an NHS hospital. They need roads, they need policing, they need all the services that our society provides. And their wealth isn't something they mysteriously generate themselves. If you stick Bill Gates on a desert island, he wouldn't actually make any money at all. He needs the society, the customers, the workers to make money. And that money, some of that should be paid back to acknowledge that contribution of society. So that's why we're calling for a wealth tax. And so we're also calling for you know, a different way of thinking about how we house people, how we travel around. In terms of housing, we've got the worst quality of housing stock in Western Europe. We have one pound and four that we spend on heating our homes, goes straight up through an uninsulated ceiling or out through a leaky door or window. So what we call for is something called the energy bill revolution, which is an idea of the government taking the money it gets in carbon taxes and insulating and providing energy efficiency measures in every home that needs it. So that means everybody has a warm, comfortable home. And if nine out of 10 households out of fuel poverty, creates 200,000 jobs and cuts carbon emissions. So it's an absolute no-brainer. And then in terms of transport, one of the things that's worth saying is that the Green Party, we're not basically concerned with how you behave as an individual. We'd like you to do the right thing environmentally, recycling, and how you travel and everything. But what we want to do is make the environmentally friendly thing to do the easiest, simplest, cheapest thing to do. And then that's what everyone's just going to do as a matter of course. So we've got to really improve public transport. We've got to make it much cheaper. 
And then just naturally people will leave their cars at home or give up on their car, maybe belong to a car club. And then we all have cleaner roads, there's less congestion for the people who actually need to be on the roads. The buses run on time. I always like the idea of the buses running on time. Uh, and yeah, we really create a different kind of transport system. So that's kind of a summary of some of the things we'd like to do that I hope you might help me and lots of other people to do to build a different kind of society. Because the final crisis that I haven't really talked about yet is the political crisis. Because we've got a situation where even you Rochester and Street by-election, people are going, isn't the by-election turnout high? It was just over 50%. So half of the people in Rochester and Scrooge didn't think it was worth voting. And that is a real problem. You look at the European elections recently, almost 70% of people didn't turn out to vote. And we're a democracy. It's really important that people feel like their vote does make a difference, that it's worth that small effort of voting. And the recent Scottish referendum really showed us the possibilities of that. You might have heard that 97% of the eligible people who were eligible to vote enrolled to vote and 85% of them did. And so what we've got to do is really offer people the chance to think, it's worth voting, my vote can make a difference. And of course that's really hard with our first past the post electoral system, because lots of people traditionally have lived in safe seats where they know who's going to get elected no matter what. But as you can see, you'll see on your televisions virtually every night, the old two, or if I'm being charitable, two and a half party system is breaking down. And there's all kind of possibilities out there. And you've probably heard of Russell Brandt's, and I'm going to paraphrase, don't vote it only encourages them. Well, I don't think there's any kind of answer in that because if you don't vote, you actually just get counted in that I'm happy enough with how things are that I can't be bothered. Vote. Instead, I've got a radical selection, suggestion for next year's election. And I hope probably quite a lot of you will be able to vote in next year's election, next May. And that is, make sure you register vote to vote, make sure you vote, and vote for the party, person or policies you like the most, that you believe in, that you feel that's closest to what I believe in. And if everybody does that, and if say 85% like the Scots, 85% of people turn out, we could have an enormous peaceful political revolution. We could have a parliament that looks entirely different to the parliament we've got now. And that would be a way of delivering a sort of politics that works for the common good, a way of really starting to rebuild a society so that everybody has enough within the limits of the planet. So I'll leave you with a final message, and I've talked about voting, but politics is much more than voting. Politics can be signing a petition, it can be sharing it with your friends, it can be setting up a group to campaign in your local community, protect the park or protect the Shoreside Centre or do anything like that. Above all, what I'm going to say to you is that politics should be something that you do, that everybody does, not something that's done to you. Thank you.